hockey team beating the U.S. hockey team? That was a, is that two out of three? Yeah, never seen it. Hey, we all watched it, I'm telling you. Okay, so uh, our, our first speaker of the morning is Russell Hedrick. Uh, it's sponsored by Cangro uh, Crop Solutions. Russell is a first-generation farmer with a strong dedication to his soil, growing fine grain and livestock through direct-to-consumer marketing. Russell farms on 800 acres in North Carolina, growing non-GMO corn, non-GMO soybeans, white wheat, black oats, which I, it's a new one to me, uh, triticalium barley, and raising uh, pasture cattle, pasture, uh, I'll get this wrong, but a cat, catadin sheep, Catan. okay. You can say that when you get up here again for us, Russell, okay. Uh, and uh, Berkshire pigs on pasture. He also operates Southern Seed and Feeds and partners with a 1712 distillery, are producing award-winning, fine quality bourbon. If that's not something from South Carolina, what is, I guess, right? Uh, join me in welcoming Russell. Good morning. <clears throat> One thing I learned about Canadians last night is they like whiskey. <clears throat> so I had, to, I had to leave a little earlier than they did. Um, to give you a little bit of a background, um, as I said, I'm a first-generation farmer. We started farming in 2012 with about 30 acres. Um, really, the journey that we've had in agriculture has really been great mentors that I've had. Um, they started me out on the right track. We started with no-till. We integrated cover crops, and then shortly after that, integrated livestock. And learning how to vertically integrate our farm has really made us profitable. So to give you an idea of where we started at, um, this is kind of how I got my agriculture background. It's a picture of my grandpa. I was pretty much uh, glued to his hip growing up. We had about 10 cows, a couple uh, acres that we made hay on. The only pictures I have of him are really in a field working. Uh, this is kind of where I got my start in animals. Uh, this was actually, I think I was about five or six years old, started out with some goats, uh, started breeding those. And uh, the one thing I learned about goats is they spend about an hour a day eating and about 23 hours a day trying to get out. Um, and that's where I got my first hat. Um, so, you know, really he was a big influence on my life, so a lot of the things that we do on the farm, we kind of keep them in mind. But for me, you know, regenerative agriculture is advocacy for rebuilding a broken, degraded agriculture production system that will heal the souls of the world that have been mismanaged by producers who were taught the wrong way to care for the land. Um, you know, the, the thing I talk about at these conferences, and I, I get so many people that talk to me, they said, well, my grandpa dissed the ground, or, you know, my great-grandpa plowed the ground, and, you know, it's been a tradition in our family. The big thing for me is those guys use the greatest technology that they had at their time, why aren't we? Um, with all the technological advances that we have in agriculture today, um, there's very, very few systems that we actually need tillage in anymore. So this is where we call home. Um, we actually farm three counties. Um, we're actually farming here. Well, maybe this one's not working. Um, we farm the county below the red one and then the county to the east. So we actually farm across three counties now. I have 26 landlords that I have to deal with every year. Um, it's a lot of Christmas cards, um, and it takes about an hour and a half in a pickup truck to get from our furthest field to our furthest field. Um, so when we plant our crop rotation, we're typically planting about two or three years ahead of, ahead of time, and uh, also our uh, cover crop rotation in that as well. So, you know, commonality between all tillage tools, um, I kind of always give a challenge at a conference. If anyone in here can tell me one thing that a tillage tool does, good that it doesn't destroy at the same time. Um, we're increasing weeds, we're destroying soil structure, um, decreasing water infiltration rates. You'll, you'll, you'll see some of our farms and we'll talk about that, but um, the biggest thing on our farm that we monitor is soil carbon. So reducing physical disturbance, this is a picture here of one of my neighbors. Um, every year I like to send him a Christmas card and a, a nice fruit gift basket because every year they like to go out and turn no till and I get free topsoil and nutrients. Um, you know, it really helps us cut down on our fertilizer budget. Um, but, you know, this is just some of the issues that we have. Uh, to give you an idea, we get about 40 to 45 inches of annual precip where I live. Um, this last year with two hurricanes, I think we were about 102 inches. Um, it was a pretty wet year. Uh, we could have grew rice if we would have known ahead of time. But uh, this is what our neighbors do in the fall. They'll go work it up. They like to bed it. And then water stands on it all winter long. Um, it pretty much goes into an anaerobic condition. Uh, then we get into cropping season, and they have to start cutting ditches to get the water off of the ground. 
Uh, one of the things that we started doing is we called the DOT and the Department of Transportation actually let us start, you know, digging that out of the ditch banks and we tested it and the nutrient content in that, I could probably, if I could get about a ton to the acre, I could cut back on fertility for about two or three more years, even further. Um, so, you know, just start thinking about what you're doing. You know, the most expensive input that I use as a farmer is fertilizer. And when you see that soil move, you're losing that fertilizer. So this is what we look like in the, uh, in the fall time. You know, we go out there with a diverse cover crop mix. Typically on our farm, we're doing about five to seven different species now. We're trying to really focus on nutrient management. And, uh, you know, my grandpa's old saying is life is hard, it's harder if you're stupid. Um, <laughs> you know, like I said, he's been a big influence on me. So anytime that we think about anything on our operation, um, you know, we really try to pay attention to the dollar and cents. Um, you know, I had somebody tell me one time at a conference, they were like, you know, you love farming so much, you'd do it for free, wouldn't you? And I said, no, I'd stay at home for free. Um, so, you know, if we're not looking at operation making money, we'll, we'll just do that practice. So let me give you an idea where we started at. This is what my soil structure looks like when I pick farms up. You know, most of the farms that I'm picking up, uh, other farmers either gave up because of resistant weed issues. Um, we've had some farms that the state has used for bridge projects, and they call it a bar pit. They'll take about five, six feet of topsoil off, you know, fill in dirt for a, a state road or something. They try to remediate it back, and we pick it up. Um, and we're really picking this ground up because no other farmer will take it. So it really helps us on rent, but the first couple years is pretty tough ground. On the right over here, um, that's what our soil starts to look like after about four or five years of no-till and cover crops and integrating livestock. But the thing I want you to pay attention to is on the top of the screen. On our farm, we're monitoring two things. It's the most two important things on my farm when we start looking at soils, and that's CO2 respiration rate which is a biological indicator of activity in the ground and water extractable organic carbon, or called WEOC. Um, that right there is pretty much like the food that the biology can consume and thrive upon. So organic matter in a sense is the house and water extractable carbon is the refrigerator that they can pull from to actually build themselves. So this is what it looks like after seven years when we've integrated livestock and cattle. You know, we went from a bright red or orange, um, high iron content, heavy clay soils to start seeing aggregation, soil structure, and it almost looks like chocolate cake when you're digging it up. And the big thing for us uh, that we first noticed the, the no-till and cover crops is look at the pore space. You know, we started seeing um, our native forest, our infiltration rates are about a half an inch an hour. Uh, we're starting to see six, seven, eight inches an hour on the second acre inch. Um, so for us, capturing that water in a dry land system has really helped with our yields. So this is kind of where we started. Um, if you didn't know, I was actually a full-time fireman for about 10 years, uh, made my switch into agriculture, and uh, this is back when I used to be a little younger and a little fitter. Um, our first cover crop, if you've never had, how many, how many people, I'm going to make y'all work a little bit this morning, how many people's planted cover crops in here? All right, that's awesome. Um, you know, maybe when you planted your first cover crop, you had the same issues we did. Um, I had anxiety. You know, I had never planted a crop before. I had just bought my first corn planter. I actually bought it in Iowa. And to tell you how good it was, it cost me more money to ship it from Iowa to North Carolina than I paid for the planter. Um, you know, so I'm worried about, you know, my neighbor's telling me no-till doesn't work. Um, so I'm, I've now got a four-row no-till uh, John Deere 7000, and we're going to go plant into this stuff, and I had no idea how well that was going to work out. Uh, we ended up doing 197 bushel corn the first year. Um, it was a really good year because corn was $8.10. Um, so, you know, that's kind of just the way the luck works. This is where we're at now. Uh, this one here we call the home run blend. It's a mix of cereal rye, triticale, oats, crimson clover, winter peas, hairy vetch, and we put a pound of rape in it. Uh, if we're trying to go for pollinator strips, we'll add a half pound of phacelia, um, and that acts as a pretty good pollinator. And then we started doing on-farm trials. Uh, so to give you an idea, those red, uh, red rectangles are litter bags. So they actually cut the, the, the cover crop and put it in a clear mesh, mesh bag and actually set it on a scale in the field. And every time it rained and the biology would consume some of that organic matter, we would actually be able to weigh the release of nutrients back into the soil solution. Uh, this was at the University of Georgia and North Carolina State. And then the little blue dots and the green squares are actually the uh, water sensors that they put in. So we were monitoring uh, water availability. and. Um, if you're actually growing cover crops, um, this is something the University of Georgia came out with. It's called the uh, Cover Crop Nitrogen Availability Calculator. Um, even here in Canada, you can ship it down to the University of Georgia. 
And what they do is they take that, that cover crop residue and they grind it up and they actually tell you how much nitrogen's in it, when it's going to release, and how long it's going to be available. Um, so this is a pretty good uh, nutrient management tool for us. Um, this is the case study that we were in. Um, we're actually doing this on 40 farms from Maryland down to Florida and we're looking at different cover crops, uh, time of termination. So the big thing is my neighbors like to terminate their cover crop about March 29th. Um, the problem with that is, is that cover crop is so small, we're releasing almost all the nitrogen from that cover crop in the first four weeks before the corn crop actually needs it. Um, so what we did is we actually waited till May the 9th and just changing from the 1st of April or the end of March to the 1st of May, we were actually able to tie up about 70% of that nitrogen later into the season whenever the corn crop actually needed it. And then we started doing check strips. You know, um, I saw a bunch of hands for cover crops. How many guys are doing check strips? How many farmers doing check strips? That's awesome. Um, you know, the first thing I was told when I started um, our district conservationist, uh, his name's Lee Holcomb, you know, we had to do a check strip to be able to monitor the difference between what we were doing. So we go out, we pull biomass samples, um, you know, measure two feet by four feet, and uh, we actually weigh it wet and weigh it dry. This is the way I do it. I do it on a trailer, just flip it over. That gives me a poundage total. Um, there's another way you can do it. You can put it in an oven at 350 degrees. Um, you know, Lee tried that when he went home and put it in the oven. He almost got divorced because of the smell. So if you're married, I don't recommend that way. Um, then we started looking at, um, you know, high biomass cover crops. This is the second year I've been farming. Uh, this is a little video of, um, this is a John Deere 4830. The uh, co-op went out and sprayed. And even with the uh, booms all the way up, he was still slapping that rye. Um, you know, when he got to the end of the field on that first pass, he jumps out and he says, man, how are you going to plant this stuff? And I said, I guess one pass at a time. And he said, there's no way that you're going to establish a crop in that. And so then my district conservationist came out and he saw this. If you've never had a nosebleed before, roll that down in an open station tractor. Um, <laughs> You know, to give you an idea how committed we are, that's a seven foot cultipacker. We were rolling about 750 acres that way ahead of planting. Seven feet at a time. Um, you know, to, to give you an idea what it looks like, this is the residue mat we're getting. Uh, that right there is about six to seven inches deep after rolling. Um, you know, my issue where I'm at is weeds. I have a, I have a terrible issue with uh, either resistant mare's tail or resistant pigweed. Um, this right here has reduced our chemical program each year by about $20,000. Um, Lee Holcomb came out when we were planting this and, you know, he kind of did the same thing. He kind of patted me on the back. He's like, oh, I got a meeting I got to go to. And I said, no, you got me into this. You're going to stay. Um, so I'm out planting the headlands and he's checking. Uh, we had really good seed to soil contact. Um, the crop started coming up. If y'all remember that check strip, you know, the only thing that this crop had, this is the first crop we never post sprayed. Um, I've, you know, Johnson grass, morning glory, sickle pod, um, cuckle burrs, pigweeds. Um, we're suppressing all of them with the mat. And then you can directly see where that check strip was where we didn't have a cover crop and that stuff just came back in. Another thing that we noticed is um, the extension came out and we're actually finding pigweeds that are about two or three feet long that are growing in the direction that the cereal rye has been laid down. Um, so not only is, you know, we're not contending with that weed because it's dying in that mat before it can come up, but also uh, we're not having to uh, worry about the seed bank, we're actually lowering it. So this is what the crop looked like seven weeks. Um, typically within seven weeks of planting, most guys have to spray it once. Um, depending on the field, they may go back and do a second post spray. And this is what it looked like at the end of the season. Um, we had really good, like I said, even, even where we did the uh, the strip around the field, we bush hogged about a five foot strip, had a field day on this farm. You know, I was so amazed that we were able to grow a crop without a post herbicide. And uh, you could go out there and pull the cover crops back. You could see that we still had good ground cover, no weeds growing underneath the canopy. But that's the difference. Uh, the one on the right is the one that did not have cover crops that was in the check strip. The one on the left did. Um, it was about an eight bushel difference for us. You know, at the current time, I think market price was about $14 a bushel. So, you know, that was pretty big. Even now, I think we're getting about 875. That's still pretty good. And then we start talking about pigweeds. Uh, this is a 30 acre farm that a neighbor of mine actually gave up. Uh, they had resistant mare's tail and pigweed on there. They had an issue with controlling it. Um, they got tired of uh, having to spray for all the weeds, so he walked away from it. And uh, we picked this farm up, and within two years, 
of integrating a healthy soil system with reduced tillage and cover crops, we were actually down to pulling maybe six to eight pigweeds out of a 30 acre field. Um, you know, my neighbor has some teenage kids. When they get in trouble, they're the farm convicts and uh, they have to go do the things that I just don't want to do anymore. So that works out pretty good too. And then we hit our good bean yields. Um, you know, we really don't shoot for yield. We get lucky sometimes, but you can see um, where uh, John is on the right, there's a little outbreak of Johnson grass. There's a few splotches in the fields. My neighbors make fun of me and say, oh, you, you know, you've got weedy fields. That doesn't bother me at all. You know, why would I go spray, you know, $900 worth of chemical on a farm for, you know, when I'm losing maybe a tenth of a bushel in that little spot. But uh, dry land, our best bean yield was 86 and a half. Uh, we placed second in the state uh, for bean yield that year. And then we started looking at sugar. Um, how many of y'all have uh, insect problems on your farm? Anybody? You know, the things that we're fighting, you know, look at nature's uh, system. I met Jonathan Lundgren, and Jonathan got to talking to me about bricks levels in our plants. And if we can get the bricks level above 14, um, because bugs can't process uh, complex sugars, it actually bloats them and they fly off. Um, so we started messing around with sugar. Um, if you've never bought sugar in bulk before, um, I went to a, a Costco and told them I wanted a pallet of sugar. And she said, honey, that's 2,500 pounds. And I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, well, you got a restaurant? And I said, nope. And she said, well, I'm going to need your driver's license. Um, she thought we were taking that sugar out in the woods. Um, so, uh, yeah, I tried to tell her we were spraying it over a crop and they didn't believe me at all. But, um, you know, looking at soybeans, um, where we had our check strip and just standard no-till, uh, our bricks level was 5.2. Uh, we tried some sugar beet molasses in a liquid form. Um, and that actually got us above 14. Uh, but then we started looking at uh, generic white table sugar and then cold process, and we were in the 30s. Um, the, my neighbors have issues with grasshoppers, stink bugs, uh, different kinds of worms, aphids or thrips in cotton. Um, and we have kudzu bugs. If y'all don't have any, I'll gladly bring you some next trip up here. Um, the only thing that they like better than kudzu is uh, soybeans. But, you know, we haven't sprayed an insecticide now in four years. Uh, not saying that I don't have insecticides in my shed, but I just don't need them anymore. And same thing with fungicides. Um, when we started looking at covering the ground, just understand as, as a farmer, 80% of the diseases that we're facing are soil-borne pathogens. And when that rainfall hits that bare ground, it splashes the spores up, and that's why we see disease move from the bottom of the plant up. With keeping that ground completely covered, we haven't sprayed fungicides in five years. So this is cotton. We were seeing about the same thing on our cotton crop. The way that he's able to do it is he's growing his corn in the cover crop strip where he's planting right now. The strip beside of it is oats and clover. He'll bale that off for hay for his cattle, then he'll come back in with a summer cover crop mix, and he'll allow that to grow during the season, and he rolls it down and plants a winter cover crop where the summer cover crop was. And next year his corn will be in that strip. And he's been rotating like that for years now, and it's been working pretty well. And then we look at what we started doing. Um, you saw that we were using that seven foot cult packer. The nosebleeds were getting expensive. Um, it's hard to find people that want to work anymore. So uh, we actually went to a farm show and they had these uh, Yetter stalk devastators that mount on a corn head. And I looked at the dealer and the display at the farm show was actually mounted to a two inch bar. And uh, I asked the dealer, I said, could I get that in three sections? I gave him the links I wanted and he said, well, what kind of corn header is it? And I said, no, it's going on a John Deere corn planter to roll cover crops down. And he looked at me like I had three heads. And uh, so we actually came home, bolted this thing up. Um, we didn't have to do any kind of modifications. There's a down pressure spring for us to uh, put pressure. I'm kind of a metalhead. Uh, nobody built the corn planter I wanted, so we built those extensions. Um, actually extended the frame back, uh, made an eight row 20 inch planter. Um, we run in furrow, and um, we used to put phosphorus out broadcast with MAP or DAP. Uh, we've actually went away from that now. Um, we're putting everything um, in behind the planter in a two by two. The problem where I'm at is with the hills that we farm, we could go broadcast fertilizer and have one big rain event and you couldn't find fertilizer on the ground on the hillside, it'd literally be in the bottom. Um, so we're trying to uh, place it a little bit lower in the ground to keep it from moving. To give you an idea, we didn't have a GPS until we got here. Um, it kind of got hard to see the other side of the field. Um, and you know, we've had, our, we've had our bad days. I use these, uh, you know, I don't really say brands when we had issues, but we had issues with a closing wheel, a spike closing wheel, and it made beautiful round bells from one end to the, to the other of the field. And uh, so, you know, we've kind of played around with different
things on our planner. Um, this is just a video of us uh, planning. Um, we try to plan into everything green and standing. Um, it's really helped us with our chemical program as well, um, allowing the, uh, the residual chemical, if we're using any, to be there a little bit longer. But, you know, just something simple. It actually, we're crimping and terminating. We're actually seeing about a 90 to 95% kill with this roller crimper. Um, you know, sometimes the vetch or the uh, crimson clover might make, it, uh, might make it a little longer in the season before it plays out, but that's never been an issue for us. But our big thing is 100% ground coverage. Um, that's what we're going for on our farm. Uh, you saw that I was driving a Kubota in the first video. I'm a big man. That's a little tractor. Um, so after four hard years, we finally upgraded to Club John Deere. And uh, that thing's like riding around in a Cadillac now. Wish I would have bought that in the beginning. Uh, this is what it looks like spraying. You know, like I said before, you can see our headlands on the left. You can see that's our AB lines to the right. And uh, then we went non-GMO. You know, the second year into farming, I called my seed salesman up. And I said, hey, you know, my neighbors had told me about non-GMO, Gabe Brown, a couple guys. And uh, I was literally told about every earthworm or wireworm or cutworm that this world had to offer and earworms that were going to come and decimate my crop. And so I called my dad and I said, look, you know, I want to try non-GMO, but the seed dealer says that it's not going to work. You know, the insects are going to take our crop. And my dad's kind of a simple guy, and he said, well, you know, have you ever saw worms in a U-Haul moving from field to field? And I said, no. And he said, well, if you didn't have them before, why would you have them now? Um, so we actually went non-GMO. Uh, first year, we did about 50% of our acres. Now we're 100%, and we're also doing open pollinated. Um, this is what our uh, non-GMO uh, looks like. You know, it's been some of the best crops that I've been able to grow. Uh, we were talking here earlier before the meeting, and uh, somebody else had a picture of this. Uh, when we went to non-GMO, we started noticing this stuff. And uh, I don't know exactly what the scientific name for that is, but we started checking the bricks on it, and it is super high in, in sugar content. And then this last year, um, the, there was a publication in, from New Mexico, and in New Mexico, they're actually finding a bacteria that is living inside of that that's fixating nitrogen out of the atmosphere and pumping it directly in through the crown roots. Um, so, you know, to me, that was pretty cool. And then we started noticing uh, mushrooms. So I get a phone call from a neighbor farmer one day, and he said, man, you got to get over to your farm on Triplet Farm Road. He said, you're going to lose that corn crop. I said, well, what's going on? And he said, oh, you got mushrooms growing in the field. He said, I can see them down almost every row. He said, you got to go spray those mushrooms out. I was like, what for? And he's like, oh, they'll take your corn crop out. I said, well, are they moving? Are they walking around like cutting the corn crop down or something? Like, I, I don't understand. So like I hopped in the truck and run down the road, and it's just these little white mushrooms. You know, that's a biological indicator to me that if I'm tilling the ground and introducing oxygen, I'm going bacterial dominant, which means I'm cycling nutrients too fast for the crop. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, you've got a forest, which is fungal dominant, and it's really, really slow release. We want to be in the middle. And when you start seeing mushrooms uh, growing in your cover crops, you're doing pretty good going to that balanced system. Another thing that we start noticing planting cover crops is when you plant cover crops, Ray Archuleta grows in your field. Um, <laughs> You know, we, uh, we had a field day, and uh, I was telling Ray about these mushrooms, and, you know, Ray couldn't believe it, so we actually, uh, we took about 350 people out to that specific farm, and everybody started picking the mushrooms, talking about going back and spreading them in their field to inoculate it. I didn't even know you could do that either. So uh, then we started looking at our uh, corn trials. You know, we've got some check strips that have been there for seven years now. Um, this check strip here is standard no-till on the left and no-till with integrated livestock on the right. And so what I can tell you is that corn on the, on the right will make 45 gallons of liquor per run and the one on the left makes 35 gallons of liquor per run. <laughs> and when Zach and Tim looked at starting up the distillery, uh, we had won an award, uh, Innovative Young Farmer Award for North Carolina and they'd just seen it. And they had invited me out, and I told them that analogy. You know, I showed them our neighbor's corn versus our. And Tim said I was full of it. He said, well, how do you know that your corn makes more liquor? You don't own a distillery. And I said, well, we just won't talk about that. Um, 
But, you know, like I said, I gave them a 2,000 pound sack and they tried another farmers and uh, we've been friends ever since. Um, you know, and we've kind of expanded the distillery. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, so this is our neighbor's corn. Uh, 2015, we went into a drought. Um, you know, the first couple years I did cover crops, I was kind of disheartened because we really didn't see a huge impact on yield versus our neighbors. You know, we did save a little bit on fertilizer and chemical. Um, we saw a little bit of a yield bump, but nothing big. And Lee kept telling me, he's like, you know, take your time, uh, don't get rushed. You know, eventually other farmers in your area will, will, will look at it and not think you're crazy. And, um, you know, we had field days and we had one guy from my home county come to the field day and he had to be there because he worked for soil and water. Um, and he would actually tell you that too. So 2015 rolls around and uh, me and Ray went and looked at some crop fields, bare ground, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning, we're looking at, you know, 40 degrees or uh, 94 degrees. And on our farms, we were about 75, 80 degrees. And this is what our neighbor's corn looked like. You know, they were picking five to nine bushel corn. And the one good thing about being a first generation farmer is I learned so many new lessons every year. And this year I learned the lesson, if you bail these stalks and feed them to cattle, you can't walk six feet behind them or you'll get painted. Um, I learned about nitrate levels. So, uh, you know, this is what our neighbors were picking. Um, our farm average that year was 128 bushels in a drought four inches of rain from March to September. So another thing that we've learned is, you know, we are connected to the food that we eat. Um, one of the things that has really been a shining star to me in, in agriculture is there's actually these new scanners coming out that we can actually pick up two tomatoes in a grocery store and scan them and it'll tell us which one's more nutrient dense. Um, for me on my farm, I think this is where the market's going in five or 10 years, that people are gonna start buying their products based on nutrient density. Um, but from 1940 to 1991, over 27 vegetables, look at the copper decline, 76%. You know, copper is one of the elements that we need in the plant to be able to fight disease. That may be one of the issues that we're seeing a lot of extra disease in our plants. Calcium, iron, all these things have declined, and that's just from up to 1991. It's actually a little lower than that today. Then we start looking at meat. Look at the decline in iron. You know, we've lost 54% of the iron in our beef production. You know. If you can take stuff like this um, with what us doing direct marketing, uh, we try to educate our consumers on the way that we're growing our crops and our animals and how they are more nutrient dense and they're willing to pay that extra money. And so if you, know, you know, if you were to eat the same stuff today that you did in 1940, you would need twice as much meat, three times as much fruit and four to five times as many vegetables to get the same nutrients that we were getting back in the 1940s. That's all, that all has to do with soil. You know, the soil is not as healthy now as it was then, either because of synthetic inputs or, uh, you know, tillage. And just remember, if you're doing tillage, it's frequency and intensity. You know, I'm not saying all tillage is bad, but think about how often you're doing it and, how, and what kind of tillage you're doing as far as the intensity. So this is our organics. Um, our church built a family center and we started doing a church garden where we donated the produce and they cooked meals for people in the community that needed them. Um, the one thing that they told us is they didn't want chemicals used or synthetic fertilizers, so we started using manures and cover crops. Um, we didn't have a roller crimper, so we were literally taking some truck tires and, and chaining them together, pulling the cover crop down. I went to Lowe's and I think I paid like 20 or $30 for that tarp. We'll put the tarp over a section for about 10 to 14 days. The sun will get bleached out of it, um, it'll go white. And we don't even till this anymore. Uh, if we're doing transplants, we take a post hole digger, we dig a post hole, we may put like a, you know, feather mill, blood mill, or some type of uh, manure if we can in with the, uh, in with the post hole if we're doing uh, corn. Uh, I got an actual tiller for a weed eater and we actually till about a six inch wide strip and then we put a uh, straw back in that strip where we have bare ground. But this is kind of our, our vegetable production and uh, organic side. And then, you know, looking at, you know, pepper plants, Chili plants, look at the difference where the soil carbon was higher versus lower. You know, what we've noticed is we've get a, we get a better stand, whether it's a row crop, vegetable production. Anytime we increase soil carbon levels, we're seeing a lot better stands in our plants. So then we started doing our uh, sensors. How many, any irrigators in here at all? Anybody using water? Um, we actually have just a little bit of irrigation where we do some trials. It's nothing big, it's just a couple acres. Um, but they came out with this sensor it goes 48 inches in the ground, and every four inches we're monitoring temperature, root depth, electric conductivity. I mean, there's a lot of things that we're monitoring with them. And this is our cover crops on the left and that strip on the right. That's one of our check strips. 
The big thing that we started noticing is we have a hard pan about 18 to 20 inches in our, our ground. And where we didn't have cover crops, we were seeing the water infiltrate down to about that 18 to 20 inch level and stop. Where we've been doing cover crops for years, we're actually changing the bulk density of the ground and we're actually breaking up part of that hard pan with roots and we're seeing water infiltrate almost twice as deep. You know, that's huge for us. Then we started looking at rainfall events. Um, we were actually seeing in the summertime where we had bare ground. When the temperatures of the ground got about 100 degrees, it was crusting over. And when it crusted over, if we didn't get a big enough rainfall to kind of break that crust up, that water evaporated before it infiltrated. So that actually didn't make it into the soil solution. And then we started looking at rooting depth. Uh, most of our roots in our corn crop were four to 44 inches deep. Where we didn't have cover crops, it was four to 16 inches deep. And that's because of that hard pan. You know, that's a huge amount of profile to be able to pull nutrients and moisture from when we get those roots deeper in the system. And then we started looking at electric conductivity. Uh, we had about twice as much uh, nutrient density. And then we started looking at soil temperatures. Uh, we monitor temperatures every four inches. And uh, we were actually warming up faster coming out of the spring and stayed cooler during the summer, um, what we saw on our farm. So the comparison is, is available moisture. We actually had seven to nine more inches of available moisture where we had cover crops than where we didn't. Um, then our rooting depth was deeper. The big thing to pay attention to is the nitrogen. Um, we applied 100 pounds less nitrogen where we had cover crops than without. And whenever we went out, this is our yield monitor. We were at 208 bushels where we had cover crops and 187 where we didn't. You know, not only did we have a yield difference, but we actually had a nutrient density, you know, difference. We were saving about $60 an acre on fertility and making about another 40 or 50 on yield. So that's pretty huge. So then we started looking at uh, who pulls their own soil samples. Still making y'all work. Make sure you're awake this morning. How deep do you pull them? Make you work. Six inches. Anybody else want to tell me how deep you pull them? Twelve. So the big thing for me is in North Carolina, they said if I was no-till, pull it four inches deep. If I was conventional, till eight inches. The problem is, is I don't farm in a flower pot. You know, I've got corn roots that are going down two, three feet deep. So why are we only sampling the top six inches? So NC State came out and we actually uh, tested three feet deep. Uh, this page here that I put together for y'all is in the top 12 inches. So the big thing to look at is potassium. In the, top, in the top four inches, I only had 100 pounds of potassium, but from four to eight and eight to 12, I had over another 100 pounds. That's the difference between applying fertilizer and not. Then we started looking at sulfur. The top four inches, I only had 24 pounds of sulfur, but from four to eight and eight to 12, I had over another 80 pounds. You know, those are two inputs that I was able to completely cut out of my operation just by changing my soil, tip, uh, soil sampling depth. Uh, just a little bit to see what those available nutrients were. Uh, as we see aggregation increase with no-till and cover crops, we're actually seeing nutrients move through the profile a little bit more. And then we start looking at the Haney test. Um, if you've never used the Haney test, uh, it's Dr. Rick Haney. He's in Temple, Texas. Um, there's other commercial labs that do this test as well. The big thing that we're paying attention to is the one-day one CO2 burst and uh, also organic carbon. Um, as we did cover crops and we integrated no-till where we, did, we weren't uh, disturbing the ground, we saw the CO2 burst increase. But in 2015, when I had a drought, we put a summer cover crop behind small grain and introduced cattle into this farm. And we, we grazed it with livestock and then our, our sheep and our pigs. And just look at the difference. We went from 134 to 495. That means that the soil biology almost doubled. You know, for us to double soil biology in one year, that's the implement, you know, that's the, that's the difference between having livestock on the farm and not. And I think almost every producer in some uh, form is going to have to introduce livestock back to start seeing some of these practices. Um, you know, this is kind of what Rick's test look like. Um, he shows you carbon, uh, nitrogen uh, to carbon ratios, and then also your CO2 burst. Um, the big thing that we talk about is if you pulled a university sample, um, and you look at nitrate, nitrogen alone, you're only going to get that green half. Uh, Rick actually picks up the other red half, the organic forms of nitrogen. And then uh, PLFA test, uh, I'm not sure if y'all are familiar with PLFA. It really just reads the biology in the ground, uh, mycorrhizal, protozoa, different bacteria counts, uh, predator to prey relationships. We also started pulling PLFAs. Then we started doing these uh, corn trials <clears throat> with North Carolina. And everybody always looks at that line going across and they always look that, hey, if I apply 150 units of nitrogen, you know, I'm going to make more corn. The big thing us as farmers need to be paying attention to is right here at zero. With zero units of nitrogen, I made 80 
130, 155, and 180 bushels of corn. Um, these plots here are five acre plots. These are, these are actually plot averages, so this isn't a university 10 by 10. The thing that I want you to pay attention to is everything on here was no-till except for plot number two, which is the square plot. And every time we applied 50 more pounds of nitrogen, we saw a yield increase. The reason is when we tilled that ground, we introduced oxygen, it became bacterial dominant, and it burned the house down early in the season. We didn't have a nutrient reserve left to, to actually break down during the rest of the season, and that's why we saw the response from the fertilizer. So the corn ear on your right had 250 units of nitrogen, the one in the middle had 125, and the one on the left had zero nitrogen. So I am a farmer, so sometimes it doesn't look good, but if you look at the top, the full rate of nitrogen was our check. It was 190 bushel corn. The half rate was 185, and where we had no nitrogen at all, we made 181 bushels of corn. You know, I lost $36 in yield, but I saved $105 an acre in nitrogen. You know, at the end of the day, over 1,000 acres of corn, that's $70,000 70, in your pocket as a farmer, just in your nutrients. That's one nutrient. So we pull stock nitrate samples. Um, you know, if you're farming corn, there's no reason that we shouldn't be pulling these stock nitrate samples. They're easy to do. Um, it gives us a report card at the end of the season, you know, how good we did on our nitrogen management. Um, the big key that we have found in these stock nitrate samples, it has to be done consistently at about the same time. So what we monitor is for black layer, and then about two weeks after black layer, we're pulling these stock nitrate samples. So farming for profit, not for yield, that's our farm motto. Um, you know, 2018, we didn't post spray 500 acres of corn, 400 acres of beans. We saved almost $20,000 in chemical. Then we started looking at our fertilizer reduction, utilizing the Haney test, uh, just in phosphorus, potassium, and nitrogen alone. Uh, when you add all those together, last year our operation saved about $91,000 over a conventional farmer in my, in my home county. So this is what some of our open pollinated corn looks like. Uh, this one here is reeds yellow dent. Um, this is actually the biggest open pollinated I've grown to date. It was uh, 46 long and 20 round. Um, like I said, we really don't shoot for yield on all of our farms. Uh, we, we try to do it for profit. Sometimes you get lucky, the rain hits right, we had the right ground. So we started picking the corn, made one pass down the field, and uh, the combine dinger started going off saying it was full, and I was like, man, there's no way. So uh, this is Lee's wife, Durr. Um, she's at our county extension. They do our yield trials. So Durr came out. We did a yield trial on this farm. We did 318.15 bushels dry land. You know, that was with 140 units of nitrogen. You know, we weren't even shooting for that yield. It just got lucky. Uh, between the soil biology, soil carbon, um, the organic matter on that farm, the breakdown of nutrient release, if you've never seen 300 bushel corn, <laughs> It's a tough one. You know, I didn't think the combine was going to slug through it all, but uh, it worked out pretty good. And then we pull stock nitrate samples. You know, it, it cost us $10 for a measuring tape and a set of shears. We measure six feet off the ground, or six inches, six feet, six inches off the ground, and then 10 inches above that. And we send those stalks off and we have a nitrate sample done. And even where we made 318 bushel corn, with 140 units of nitrogen, we were still excessive. That tells me two things. If I would have had more moisture, I could have made more bushels, or I could have cut back even more on my fertility. You know, what we're seeing with the ground building soil organic carbon and soil organic nitrogen is amazing. So once again, when I started farming, I had a seven foot grain drill, planting 750 to 1,000 acres a year of cover crops. And then we were planting probably three to 400 acres of double crop beans with that. That is a lonely farmer in his field. Finally moved up to Club John Deere. This is a farmer with a girlfriend. I now have free time. Um, you know, if you've never, you know, if you've never planted all that with a seven foot drill, you know, try it out one time, see how you like it. But, you know, we finally got a 15 foot drill, a little bit bigger tractor. Um, it's been kind of fun to grow the farm. Uh, we've really tried to reinvest about every dollar we've made on the farm uh, to kind of grow it to the operation that we have now. Uh, we integrated livestock. Um, 2013, I was still working at the fire department. Ray Archuleta calls my cell phone, and I was like, I got to come off the truck. I got to take this. So Ray talks for 30 minutes about how to mob graze my cattle, herd them like buffalo, all these things, and then he takes a breath. 
And I finally got to talk, and I was like, Ray, I don't have any cows. And he's like, oh, you got to buy cows. Well, 2013, cows were $2 a pound at the sale barn for somebody else's headache that could barely limp in there. So we bought 10 cow-calf pairs. Half of them already had their calves on the ground. Um, I thought that a springer meant that they were going to have their calves in the spring. What it was is I went to the fire department, and they sprung over the fence into the highway. Um, then the highway patrolman called you. So we got rid of those, went stalkers for a while. Now we're back to cow-calf pairs. But my point is, is, you know, don't make this hard. Everybody talks about, well, you know, what if my paddock size isn't right? What if they're not straight? What if I want to go on vacation? You know, I'm here with y'all now because my cows have the whole farm. We typically don't like to do that, but don't, don't hem yourself up with this. Have fun with it. If I want to go to the beach for a weekend, I just give them a bigger section. And when I get back, I find where to start them again. You know, don't make this harder than it really is. Uh, this is what it looks like in our summer cover crops. Um, if we get a pretty degraded piece of ground, we'll actually put a summer cover on it and integrate cattle before we go to cash crop. This is the reels that we use. Um, notice on this reel there is a rubber, rubber handle on the, on the stick part. My first one, I bought a cheap one. It didn't have that. It was electrifying. Um, our farm motto on, on animals is under-engineer and over-electrify. Um, it put me on my knees. It was like a 10-mile charger on like five acres. And I literally felt it through my wrist and like knew what was going to happen when I heard that pop. But, uh, you know, we got rid of that. These are Gallagher reels. Um, like I said, they're pretty nice reels. They're cheap. They're, you know, 60 bucks, and we can do a lot of running with them. The big thing is, is notice how much we're leaving. Um, you know, 99.9% .9 of all cattle producers I talk to love to overgraze because if it's green, it'll turn into beef, and they want to graze it. Just understand that the most productive part of a plant is in the top third. And we're taking no more than half. If we eat more than half of that plant, we're sacrificing root growth, which, which is a, a delay in the time that we're seeing that regrow. So if we're taking at least a you know, third to a half and staying above that, we're seeing faster regrowth. This is our new operation. Um, you know, operational diversity is key to success. We're trying to get pinatas to eat the candy. Sometimes I get a laugh out of that one. Uh, these are our Katahdin hair sheep. Uh, the one thing that I have learned about sheep is if the wind blows, they die. They also have fun things like hoof rot that you have to put copper on, copper tox on, which smells. Um, fly strike, um, never buy sheep off of Craigslist is another word of advice. <laughs> um, you know, genetics are key. Um, like I said, so many good lessons. Um, so then um, I used to live in the city, and when I lived in the city, I had about an acre and a half behind my house. I always wanted to do something with it, so we started fencing it in. And uh, my neighbors thought that we were getting a dog, and they came home, we had 14 pigs. And um, so we went with Berkshires, um, never had pigs before. And uh, I'll be honest with you, pigs are probably my favorite animal. And uh, so we started grazing them. And uh, this is my daughter. She was two in this picture, but she literally learned how to count with pigs. And uh, she's, she's been fun around the farm. Uh, then we start doing, you know, start pulling manure samples. We know about what a pig does a day. And if we got 20 pigs out there, we can start seeing how many uh, nutrients we're moving in. This is our uh, bacon. These are our pork chops. That's not a ribeye steak. Um, you know, we sell bacon for $11 a pound. We sell these for $9 to $10 a pound. Uh, we do all our marketing on Facebook. We'll talk about that in the breakout later. Uh, this is Michael Thompson from Kansas. I'm 6'6", he's 6'10", and that's the ear above his head. Um, this is Bloody Butcher. It's from 1845. We started raising it. Um, this is what it looks like. This is one of our open pollinated corns. Um, we're getting 9 to $14 a bushel for this in grain form. Uh, we'll talk about it later in the breakout, but if I grind this in the grits, it's about $250 a bushel profit. If I make this into bourbon, it's about $500 a bushel profit. Um, start looking at different markets. Uh, we started small. This is our Facebook page. Um, you know, when we first started grits, they were in nothing more than a you know, clear bag. And, you know, we sold that two bags for 15 bucks. That's seven fifty a pound. You know, multiply that by 56 pounds in a bushel. This is what we do now. We have a little bit nicer bag. Um, that's our bourbon bottle in the back. We put it in this basket, and we sell this basket for 125 bucks at Christmas time. And we empty out Hobby Lobby with all these baskets. Um, this is one of the ways we're doing our marketing. Uh, this is our Blue Hopi corn. Uh, we started going into Blue Hopi. It is a ugly corn from the time you plant it till the time you pick it. Um, you know, but it'll make corn in a drought. 
Uh, this is Emma a little bit later. You know, the one thing she likes to do is uh, feed pigs and pick corn. So uh, she always rides with me during corn planting. Um, then, you know, this is our distillery. Uh, we started barreling back in 2014. We do, uh, you know, bourbon moonshine. Uh, we're making a triticale whiskey. Uh, we're bringing in some brandies and some different products. We're making a butcher's bourbon out of the Bloody Butcher. And, uh, you know, we're selling in 38 states now, and we can ship quite a few places. Um, then we built a seed warehouse. Uh, we started using so many cover crops that it really wasn't cost effective for us to ship them across the country. And we had a, a lot of uh, producers that wanted some custom seed cleaning. So uh, this is a Clipper 29D, and they tore apart the Ark or Columbus's ships and built it. Um, then we've got a gravity table, a way hopper, um, where we can pre-batch for our blends. We've got about a 10,000 pound mixer, and then we've got a bagging system beyond that. You know, for me, I'm, I'm working with Soil Health Consultants. Um, I'm actually going to be up here in Canada a little bit this year. Um, the Southern Cover Crop Council, um, I know y'all are north, but there's some really great information on our website there. Um, NACD, Soil Health Champions, if you're not familiar with that, um, that's a really good resource for farmers. But uh, if y'all are interested in coming to North Carolina, we're doing a field day on August the 10th. And uh, we'll do a tour around some farms. We've got some speakers coming in, and then we end with a distillery tour. We always end with that because everybody has too much fun. And, uh, and then we're doing a three-day soil health course in November. But this is my, uh, this is my email address, my cell phone. Uh, just understand I haven't seen my home since January 4th, and I get home like March 24th or 25th. You know, if you've got any questions or anything I can help you with, uh, be sure to give me a call, uh, send me an email, and I'll get back to you as quick as I can. And uh, I think we may have just a time for a question or two. If y'all would like, but thank you for your time. I appreciate it. I know we're going to get a chance for some questions during the breakout sessions. I do have a question. You talked about black oats. And I didn't see anything in black oats. What's the deal with the black oats? So the, my sister has celiac, and she can't deal with gluten. And we grew these black oats. They're good for suppressing nematodes. Um, but we made a whiskey out of them. We made a black oat whiskey. And it tasted really good if you could get past the front of it where it tasted terrible. Um, <laughs> so uh, we're now using some different, we're, we're using a different oat. They bred us an oat that's a hullless oat. And uh, it's working out pretty good. But as far as covers go, um, if you have nematode issues in vegetable production or sandier ground, there's actually a root exudate that those black oats make that we've seen soybean cyst and root knot nematodes getting cut in half within one cover crop season. Um, so black oats have been a pretty big, uh, pretty big component for that. Okay, I'm going to steal one minute out of a break here. Um, quick question is, uh, how, how is the sugar used? You talked about taking skids home and you're making bourbon but that's not what you're using it for primarily. So what are you using it for? So the way we're using the sugar is every crop gets a half pound in furrow. Uh, we typically run like two gallons of in furrow fertilizer with a half pound of sugar and water. And so that's going in furrow. So we're pulling it up through the plant early season, um, trying to get those bricks levels up early in the season to you know fight against pests. On soybeans, we're applying a half a pound to a pound per acre over the top of the beans. Uh, corn typically takes a pound to a pound and a half because of you know just so much more vegetative growth. And the way we're doing it is simply we mix it up in a 275 gallon tote with water, allow it to you know pretty much go into a slurry, and we can either pump that directly into our planter with our fertilizer or directly into the sprayer and uh, spray that over the crop. But to give you an idea, it costs about a dollar to a dollar and fifty cents an acre for that full program to increase the bricks and. The big thing is we're only targeting the predator insects that are actually going to be eating that plant, and we're not getting rid of the beneficials like ladybugs and other things that we're trying to keep on the farm. So that's, that's kind of how the sugar works. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank you. Great presentation. Uh, you'll, get, you'll get another chance if you go to one of the breakout sessions that Russell's involved with to ask some more questions. Obviously a great presentation with a lot of depth, so appreciate it very much.